I thought I'd start off uh, with a couple of uh, reminders on what the issue is, sort of what was the problem and what did we do, uh, and what do people think is missing, and then I come to uh, the task that Michael set me, uh, what are the political constraints. So uh, I think the easy part is uh, what, what was the problem uh, we set out uh, in, uh, for a nice meeting of the Eurogroup uh, in uh, late 2009 uh, and emerged uh, with the knowledge that the fiscal problem in Greece uh, was much, much larger than the government had said. And this came on top uh, of the already, uh, the aftermath of the, the ongoing great financial crisis. Uh, we had experienced the great financial crisis, the banking crisis in Europe, the sovereign cr debt crisis, uh, and which later morphed into the uh, euro crisis. And uh, contrary to uh, what people at the time thought, uh, it was not, I think most people would agree today, it was not only uh, a fiscal crisis, uh, but considerably uh, more. Uh, we had experienced significant imbalances within the euro area, which had built up uh, over the first decade uh, of EMU. Just as an example, uh, Spain uh, entered uh, the millennium uh, with a net international investment position of around 30% and six years later, 90%. So 10% current account deficit per annum, uh, which uh, was uh, obviously not sustainable over the medium uh, and long term. Uh, we had uh, experienced a huge buildup of leverage uh, in the banking uh, sector which, if you looked at Ireland, for example, then uh, exploded uh, with a spectacular crash uh, when the short-term uh, financing of one part side of the balance sheet uh, challenged the other side of the balance sheet. But of course, there was also a fiscal uh, issue. So uh, I think we very rapidly uh, concluded, most people very rapidly concluded uh, there was a problem of uh, fiscal, there was a problem of macroeconomic imbalances, and there was a huge problem uh, in the financial uh, sector. And altogether uh, would have been not at all manageable probably uh, at the national level if there had not been monetary union, and given monetary union, it still wasn't manageable. However, the spillover effects within monetary union were much larger than they would otherwise have been. Intra alia, because the central bank of the euro area has a different mandate, has different possibilities than the central bank of a single nation, nation state, such as the Bank of England or the Fed. Uh, Michael already alluded to the different reports uh, that very wise men wrote. Uh, or said that they wrote, or pretended that they wrote. Uh, it was the four presidents report, which later was followed by the five presidents report. Uh, the first one was better, the four presidents report. It set out uh, visions of a banking union and a fiscal union and an economic union and pillar number four, democratic accountability. We in 2012, we're in deep trouble. And as they say in English, the fear of hanging focuses man's mind, and the fear of collapse focused politicians' mind. And out of the four issues, fiscal union, banking union, economic union, democratic accountability, we emerge from that part of the crisis at least with one, namely with banking union by and large. If you want to, we can go uh, into some minutiae in the debate, but that's not, uh, that's not uh, the real issue uh, for today. We had a series of other interesting changes and reforms, some of them at the global level. Think of uh, changes in financial market regulation, which led, for example, to the uh, principle of bail-in, 
uh, instead of bailout uh, of banks. Uh, there was the so-called fiscal compact, uh, which some people liked very much and other abhorred, at least uh, to an equal uh, extent. Uh, there were significant changes in how the Stability and Growth Pact, the fiscal framework, uh, are run. Uh, for the aficionados, the keywords are two-pack, six-pack, uh, etc. And uh, there was something which is called the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, which people ask me, and why doesn't it bite? And I think we'll come to that issue of why instruments work and why they work less uh, in the uh, course. But it was supposed to address the very multifaceted reasons and multifaceted drivers why you have macroeconomic imbalances within a monetary union, i.e., when the exchange rate adjustment mechanism is missing. So we are now, uh, and we exited uh, the crisis proper, therefore, with banking union in sight. Uh, the fiscal issues had been partially dealt with, but largely left aside. Economic union, difficult to define democratic accountability, uh, something that anyway only works uh, in the context, probably only works in the context of a treaty change. So quite a lot of the elements that we set out in 2012 are missing. And I come now to the task that Michael set me. Why are they missing? So the main element that people consider to be missing is fiscal union. And that's where lots of people agree. And then you start asking them, what for you is fiscal union? And if you ask 10 economists, you probably get, people usually say 11 answers, nine answers. Uh, and this has a much longer history than uh, people with shorter historic memories uh, may recall. Uh, there was the so-called Werner Plan, which is nearly as it's older than some of you in the audience, uh, but it failed. Um, we had uh, the discussion in Germany in the 80s, uh, which was very largely driven uh, by somebody who was later German finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, which in German was called the Krönungstheory, the crowning theory. And that was the real debate about how should monetary union come about? And to their mind, and they were nearly all lawyers, and I think that's important to remember the distinction between how lawyers look at monetary union and how economists look at monetary union. Uh, and the story behind this crowning theory was that only if and when you have entered a political union with full democratic accountability, then and only then can you enter monetary union because otherwise it wouldn't work. So a very complete contract. Um, whereas the way that the European Union, the European Economic Community and later the European Union had come into existence uh, was more the Schumann way of doing it, peu à peu and forged through crisis and only when something hits the fan, then, then there will be change and it will be rather incremental uh, than a grandiose design. And at one stage I asked uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, how the hell could you all agree on, uh, how could you agree on a Maastricht Treaty uh, which was lacking such important issues such as banking union? And he looked at me and he said, young man, it was all there in the first draft, but the politicians took it out. So there's no cognitive innovation. It was all known. But it was politically impossible or undesirable. Guten Abend. Uh, so Maastricht then turned out uh, as it did. And the way it turned out was a very, very strong retention of national sovereignty, of constitutional sovereignty, not impeded by any supranational treaties. So 
and the English think they are constrained. Anyway, so these issues, with that we entered uh, MU, we entered in uh, 99. Uh, we thought we had a good fiscal framework, or some people thought we had a good fiscal framework of rules. And Mario Draghi often makes the distinction, he says, well, within a monetary union, for, for things, either you've got institutions, VIDE, the European Central Bank, but if you don't have institutions to rule something, regulate something, then you need rules. And the corollary, obviously, is rules that people respect. Who are the first people who more blatantly disregarded the fiscal rules was Germany and France in 2003, as a result of which the fiscal framework was changed. It was changed from that what Romano Prodi called the stupid fiscal uh, uh, rules to more intelligent fiscal rules. The only problem with the intelligent fiscal rules was that they were so intelligent uh, that they were nearly inapplicable in practice and political uh, reality. But it was strongly recognized that the fiscal framework that we had was not really up to the business, as it were, of being the counterpart of a centralized, uh, centralized monetary policy. On financial stability, very few people were thinking uh, of the high degree of correlation that you have cross-border between bank balance sheets. There were two people who were traveling uh, Europe at the time trying to persuade us and many others of the significant dangers of national supervision not constrained by any common rules on supervision or resolution of banks, etc. One of them was Klaus Regling, and the other one, some people may know him, Max Watson, uh, who was at the IMF uh, for, for many years, and they tried to persuade policymakers throughout Europe, but the dangers to financial stability with high degree of interlinkages in bank balance sheets. Nobody was listening to them or not listening to them adequately, and so things uh, happened uh, as they did. So the picture that we had uh, after a decade of uh, monetary union was the centralized uh, monetary policy, decentralized, <laughs> not very coordinated uh, fiscal uh, uh, policies, and the big difference to uh, a non-monetary union in a banking crisis, uh, there would be no possibility for, by and large, unconditional liquidity support of the central bank. This is constrained uh, by the Maastricht uh, Treaty, whereas, for example, in the US or in England, the central bank can give liquidity support against the guarantee of a government. So let us discuss the different constraints uh, that we are facing. So some of the constraints, and quite obviously, we are in a situation where one could think that the glass is one third full and two thirds empty, but that's a matter of appreciation. Uh, is that a necessity? Could it not be any different or could it be different? And one of the driving forces of why the glass is not much, much fuller is the old issue that Wolfgang Schäuble and others were referring to back in the 80s already, the issue of constitutional sovereignty. And in the case of fiscal policy, uh, you quite clearly have the, ulti the ultimate responsibility for fiscal policy lies with national parliaments, lies with national governments, and it's the core of economic policy constitutional uh, responsibility. So we set up a system of rules, very complicated, the so-called Vademecum has 255 pages, and I know the one person who actually understands them. He's Italian. Uh, we set up this very complicated system, but the thing about the rules is they are ultimately not binding. They have a high degree of political importance, 
at least as long as everybody follows the rules, there is a strong push for politicians, for national politicians to follow these rules. But once people start going against these rules and not much happens, uh, it's very difficult to go to your finance minister and say, look, here's, the, here's what the rules prescribe and you should be doing this, that and the other, otherwise things will happen. And the minister will turn to you and say, what will happen? Uh, I think country one, two, three, four, five, they went against the rules. One country has been in excessive deficit for 10 years, nothing happened. So why should I? Why should I incur the political cost? And that is essentially uh, uh, what happened. We have the issue rules versus institutions, rules where the constitutional responsibility lies with the member state. And all calls for fiscal union, i.e. a supranational element for fiscal policy, are exactly a call for, but they would require a completely different constitutional setup of the European Union. They would require that we shift, even a small shift of fiscal responsibility to the center would require a shift of constitutional responsibility to a center, the center, and a carving out of this responsibility out of 19 national constitutions, which is extremely difficult, at least in the short run, and maybe the medium term as well. So and this is, for me, the dividing experience between lawyers talking about monetary union and economists talking about monetary union. If I go to a lawyer, and say, let's talk about monetary union and fiscal union, he will say, oh, yeah. tell me when you will have 19 referenda, treaty change, da, 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 da. Uh, and then we can maybe talk about the setup of the European Parliament, how it would be responsible for certain aspects of fiscal policy. Whereas the economists, they are in different camps, of course, but some economists, uh, especially south of the Alps, uh, will say fiscal union. Of course, uh, we need uh, a large central budget with fiscal, uh, which uh, with automatic stabilizers, it can ensure us against asymmetric shocks and do this, that, and the other. And therefore, this to me is not only a political problem of completing economic and monetary union, it goes much deeper. It is a constitutional issue. And because it's such a constitutional issue, it's a political issue. And there are, of course, ways around it. But as long as many constitutional lawyers are talking about this issue, we will never get to the stage where we talk about the practicalities. So we'll see, what about President Macron's win, as it were, in the Euro summit, in the recent Euro summit? Well, the so-called budgetary facility, uh, which is of a rather smallish nature, will be embedded in the EU budget, subject to the same rules, subject to probably the same conditions. We will see what people agree on, on what it should be spent. But one thing it definitely is not. It is not a conjuncturally sensitive euro area budget. So this is uh, maybe the first point that I would want to make. Secondly, if we look at the other part of public budgets, tax, I would say within a monetary union, there's much to be said uh, for having a fairly high degree of coordination on tax. And you could even argue that absent the exchange rate mechanism, uh, corporate income tax, for example, is a proxy or can be used for devaluations instead of the exchange rate. So there is a uh, strong case to be made against tax competition by having at the minimum, a minimum level for corporate income tax and possibly uh, some others. Again, tax is an issue uh, which is regarded sometimes constitutionally, sometimes just de facto, as one of the core uh, competences, pol economic policy competences of national parliaments. As such, this explains why, because of its constitutional nature, this explains why we have unanimity requirements 
uh, for many kinds of uh, tax uh, agreements at the, at the EU level. And therefore, uh, at some, in some instances, we have what is a constitutional problem. And in other instances, we have a problem uh, which is simply one of finding the necessary uh, unanimity, even though there would be no constitutional problem per se. As you know, uh, there are quite a number of directives on tax uh, within the European Union, which we have transposed into national law, but these pertain predominantly to value-added tax and excise, uh, which are of a political but not such hugely political nature. So. We then enter areas which are constitutionally possible but politically difficult. And here I come for, uh, as an example to how we set up the uh, European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, our firewall as we used to call it uh, many years ago, 80 billion euro of paid in capital. It can give five, up to 500 billion of loans to member states with either solvency or liquidity problem. And of course, by, provide, by giving loans to member states, it creates a contingent liability for all member states. Yo, said many of the member states, if this is the case, then we require doing this in unanimity. And we also cannot go the route that we normally take, namely by doing this along the lines of the méthode communautaire, with the role of the Commission and then of the European Parliament and the Council co-decides with the European Parliament, was impossible. Many member states said, look, uh, we're putting in national money by giving a loan to member states, we're con creating a contingent liability. If we create a contingent liability, we have to go to our Parliament each and every time. And for six years, I was living more to the calendar uh, of quite a number of member states, parliaments, meeting calendars uh, than to any other uh, calendar. You always had to be aware, when does uh, the budget committee of this parliament, that parliament, that parliament, when does it meet? What will it say? What are the main actors saying, uh, et, et cetera. So in those instances, where, it is con where something is constitutionally possible polit but politically very difficult, you have the choice, either you block it, people don't like it. Or you say, well, let's at least do it along the intergovernmental method. And the intergovernmental method is something, if you mention that in Brussels, you get kicked out of town. It is, people abhor it because it is to the detriment of the powers of the Commission. It totally bypasses the European Parliament, horribile dictu, um, and renationalizes in a way that is at least the feeling, it renationalizes decision making. So, uh, but that was because of these political constraints which require not only unanimity, at least unless in extremis, which require unanimity and going for many, going to Parliament each and every time before a decision is taken. So we've got constitutional problems, we've got political problems which either get blocked or if they are not blocked, you go. Uh, if they uh, impinge on constitutional rights, uh, you go at least the route of intergovernmentalism. And well, uh, what are then uh, the uh, uh, the issues uh, that we're dealing with which might be a bit easier. I've been talking now quite a lot about fiscal issues. The big discussion over the last months uh, and indeed years has been more about completing banking union, uh, adding to the single supervisory mechanism that we have, adding to the single resolution board and single resolution fund that we have, something on deposit uh, insurance. And incidentally, one may ask, why did banking union actually, why was it able to come about if all of this is so much about treaty provisions and constitutional 
rights and the sovereignty of national supervisors? The answer is, out of the many, many, many issues that had been contained in the first drafts of the Maastricht Treaty, one little article remained. One little article remained that said that the ECB could possibly, at one stage, one day, be entrusted with issues of banking supervision. Which means, doesn't mention insurance, doesn't mention securities, only banking. But at least we had a coat hanger on which to hang the large coat of supervision and banking union. And in banking union, uh, in completing banking union and going towards a deposit insurance scheme, we're facing similar issues. Um, we are possibly at the limit creating contingent liabilities for member state governments. Why is that? In the most uh, uh, developed scheme of European deposit insurance, you have one big deposit insurance pot. And in this deposit insurance pot, banks pay in and depositors, uh, if they lose their money, are reimbursed, but you need a backstop. What happens if you run out of money? Then you have to go to the member state and the member states will have to put in money to replenish the empty pot possibly to be repaid by the banks, but uh, there may be a call on uh, government money. Lo and behold, say, uh, especially the constitutionalists and the constitutional lawyers, this is a contingent liability over my dead body, unless intergovernmental, and unless I know how risks are actually incurred. And they need to be in a level playing field because why should I, as a bank in country A, be liable to risks that are being created in country B if I don't trust the way that risks develop there? And these risks can develop because management in a certain bank in country B is more prone to risk. We also greet the Central Bank of Austria. Mm -hmm. um, prone to take more risks. That's something you can live with. A supervisor should deal with that. Or you have more risks. Uh, because national uh, regulation, to the extent that it still exists, is more benign. Or you have uh, more risks because national insolvency administration and procedures are completely different. Or you have more risks, and now comes the probably one of the more important points, because banks in country B have loaded up their balance sheet with sovereign bonds to an above average extent. And what if spreads blow out for that country? Then the balance sheet of the bank is under stress and possibly needs to be bailed out or in. And why should we in country A then be liable for the problems in country B? So that's what people, especially north of the Alps say, if and only if we can trust how risk in bank balance sheets is created, then and only then will we be prepared to share this risk. Share it through a common deposit insurance scheme. So this shows that there are different levels of problems of getting to a solution, of moving forward on deepening economic and monetary union. We've got the true constitutional issues. We've got a very large bucket of problems which are of a political nature, which can be solved, but are constitutionally, which touch upon sovereignty to such an extent that you have to resort to intergovernmentalism and possibly only then, then and only then, if the economic situation uh, is rather fragile, which can move politicians towards agreeing on something. And the third pot, of difficulty of agreeing on something is where there is simply mistrust between member states. Mistrust because they have the feeling, right or wrong, that things are handled in a uh, more lax fashion in other countries than in their own. We have overcome the problem that you don't trust banking supervision in other countries by having a centralized banking supervision. But there are many other issues where people 
especially north of the Alps, have the feeling that in some areas of the Euro uh, zone, things are handled in such a manner, they don't want to share that risk. So we require a move towards being able to trust each other through cooperation, through agreements, through agreements that are not sort of centered on one little issue at a time, but which are all encompassing. If you have large envelopes, there's something in it for everybody. This has been not the way we have been working over the last 15 years. And I think this is one of the reasons why progress has been much, much slower than it otherwise would have been. Secondly, uh, working uh, on uh, the issue of democratic accountability by having a considerably higher degree of involvement, practical uh, uh, as well, higher degree of involvement of national parliaments. The European Parliament, the much revered and respected European Parliament, uh, has such a huge role in the area of European legislation and Europe European politics that a number of national parliaments have more or less uh, stopped discussing these issues and depoliticizing them in a way, in the short term, which very much politicizes them in the long run. So if you go to a national parliament and say, what about how does this regulation come about and why is this and how is the transposition working? He says, ask my colleague from the European Parliament. And this sort of intellectual or knowledge vacuum in national parliaments has eroded, I think, part of the legitimacy of the European integration process. <coughs> Coordinate more with national parliaments. And lastly, there is the big constitutional question. Uh, Guy Verhofstadt is, of course, a great fan of uh, moving forward to a federal European state rapidly. Many people have very differentiated views on this, uh, but for the practicalities of the next five years, I don't think uh, that uh, we will uh, be dealing with this issue too much. And given the present political situation, uh, populist uh, 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 situation with the issue of sovereignty and uh, uh, independence uh, and so on uh, being more and more mentioned, I think this is not something uh, for now, even though we know that in the ultimate configuration, uh, constitutional changes may be uh, necessary. So spectacular progress will be very slow. I think there are ways in which you can make practical uh, progress uh, already in the short run, uh, let alone in the medium term. But the question, of course, arises, and I think I should be coming to a close shortly. But the question finally does arise, how do you deal with coming to conclusions and agreements in a European Union of, for now, 28? Maybe in a year's time, still 28. Who knows? Um, how do you come to an agreement in a European Union of 28? It was already difficult coming to agreements on the internal market program of 12 and then of 15, 28. So heterogeneity has increased simply because of the simple arithmetic. But there is also a, a larger divergence of interest between countries such as Bulgaria and Ireland. It is not to say that these interests are not legitimate, but they're different. So finding the common ground where all 28 can agree has gotten more and more difficult. The interests are divergent for many reasons. So what would one say if one has been learning European practical law? The answer is we've got qualified majority voting. Outvote the blighters. When deciding on the internal market program, this was easy. You vote on the tractor seat, nobody cares if you're outvoted on the tractor seat. Well, some farmers maybe. Uh, even standards for capital requirements for banks, it's technical, qualified majority voting. We've fairly recently seen an example which is on an issue which is very close to national sovereignty, very close to national identity, migration. There was qualified majority voting in one instance. Number, many 
a couple of member states were outvoted. The decision was never implemented because it was so close to identity, national interests, sovereignty, simply didn't happen. So we have to think, can one just have QMV on more and more and more issues? This is bad for democracy. Uh, countries who are outvoted on elements which are so close to their sovereign interests will feel disenfranchised. They will feel that Europe is betraying them. So we have to think, what can we do? There's one possibility we don't do anything and we stop here, stop in our tracks, which is fine if the world around us isn't changing at all. Rumor has it, it is. Or we try to come to grips with this. And I think coming to grips with this, to my, to my mind, means uh, that we have to have a sort of a core homogeneous European Union, which is around the internal market plus. But we should allow for a certain degree of flexibility by having what uh, we have called a Europe of clubs, that you have a very limited set of clubs within which those countries uh, that are that have joint interests and the joint responsibility move together. One club, for example, for the Euro. One club for Schengen, migration, including citizenship, visa, etc., etc. One club for foreign and security policy, and then one club for the other issues. You would have to accept, accept a higher degree of discipline in there. You would have to commit to respect being outvoted in certain instances. But I think it is only through such means that you can move Europe forward in certain areas where some countries simply, they don't want to join maybe in three, four years. They say today, we don't want this. And on, in, a, in a European Union of 28 countries, you will always find somebody who said, I don't want this. Can we be blocked? We can be blocked. Should we be blocked? We shouldn't be blocked. So we've got to deal with that. With that, I come to an end, and there may be a question or two. Thanks very much.